Hello once again, it's Pastor John Carlo from Christian Pentecostal Church, and we are continuing our study today in regard to sin, an interesting word. Where did it begin? What, what first example do we have of it? Most of all, everybody will go to Adam and Eve, but actually sin became before that. In the sense of, in Revelations 12, we read from verse one on, it talks about how Lucifer, who was the archangel, the music ministry of heaven, apparently tried to cause a, a, a division in heaven. And apparently, this was a, a, an archangel who had, a, I would assume, a very excellent way of convincing people, because, listen to this carefully, the angels in heaven were created by God. And we don't know how many there are, but there seem to be trillions, billions, whatever you want to put down. And imagine one of them deciding that he was going to take God's place. And he convinces one third of this group of, 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 of angels who saw God every, I shouldn't say every day, but all the time. And wanting to follow Lucifer rather than God, the Father. So again, we see that disobedience that occurred was the actual first sin. And we know that the devil was punished, and he's, I always say he's been sentenced, but he's out on his own recognizance, but he knows where he's going. But we also want to see that as a result of that first sin, and sin is basically disobedience. Disobedience to God's law, God's word. And again, many people will try to go around it and try to use words to cover their sin. But we're going to see that as, according to God, sin is sin. Let's take a look at what happens. We know in Genesis, in the second chapter, here God had created a man, Adam. And this man was created out of dust. Again, he didn't have parents, he didn't have uncles and aunts, he didn't have a father or a mother to teach him how to be a man. And then later on, God takes out of Adam a rib and he makes a woman. And the same thing. These two individuals didn't know how to be adults. They weren't born children growing up, they were born adults. And God would walk with them in the garden and teach them, and I guess answer their questions, whatever their questions were. But look what happens. It's a perfect place. There's peace, there's food, they don't have to work, they don't have to do anything other than take care of it. They had dominion over everything that God created, the animals, everything. All they had to say was stop or go or whatever they had to say, and they would have to do it. And here they are in this beautiful garden. Let's take a look at it. If we go to Genesis, Chapter 2, we'll see it beginning in verse 16. <clears throat> and the Lord God commanded the man, notice he told, tells Adam, the man, saying, of every tree and of the garden thou mayest freely, freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in that day that thou hast eaten thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, it wasn't talking about physical death, but spiritual death. That leads to physical death, right? Mm. And then we see that God creates Eve. And she also is aware of this law by God. Probably the first law that we read that men had, women had was not to eat of the fruit of that special tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, they already knew about God, good, but God didn't want them to know about evil. But just like us, they got curious, right? And what happens is that we read where, in chapter 3, who comes along? Our friend Lucifer, who's now Satan. And he goes to Eve. Now, we could start an argument with this. Why did he go to Eve and not to Adam? Was she smarter? Was she stronger? We don't know. But he goes to her, and he has a conversation with her. And look at, at the way he convinces her to do what she knew was wrong. 
Now the serpent, which he comes in the form of, was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said ye will not eat of every tree in the garden? Did God say that? No, he didn't say that. Everything but that one tree. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the, fru of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, it shall, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. So she counteracts his statement. And the serpent said, He doesn't give up unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Are you sure of that? For God knows that in that day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So he's convincing her that she could become a goddess if she ate from the tree. And what it causes her to be tempted. She goes apparently and she goes and look at the tree. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, right? And it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree to be desired to make one wise. He convinced her that everything that he said was true and yet it was a lie. And it says she took of the fruit thereof and eat it and look at this. Who was with her and gave also to her husband who was with her and he did eat. So here we have the devil is convincing Eve and somehow she is now with Adam and she goes and picks the fruit. What should he have said? He should have said, God said, we can't do that. We can't eat it. Drop that fruit and forget about it, right? No. He says nothing. And apparently, he ate the fruit after she had eaten it first. And it says, and the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they, they sewed fig leaves and so on. They knew that they had sinned against God. They had disobeyed. That was the only thing that God told them they could not do. And again, we can see here that the devil, just like he convinced all the angels to follow him, he convinced Adam and Eve, even though he says nothing. When you, when you don't say no, it means you agree with the person who's going to do something. And both of them were convinced that somehow they would get some, some magical powers if they did and ate this fruit. Amen. And of course, that particular situation caused a lot of problems, not only for Adam and Eve, but for us. Because in, as we go on reading in chapter 3, we see the Lord God found out. And he went looking for them, and he challenged them. And he said to them, in verse 11, and he said, who told you that, that you were naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereon I commanded? He's questioning them. That thou shouldest not eat? And the woman, and the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to me, to be with me, she gave it to me of the tree and I did eat. Wow, what a hero. He turns around and blames her, right? He blames her. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done, right? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. Notice how Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the serpent, the serpent, right? All of them trying to put off what they had done to someone else. And notice here in verse 14, here we see the first response, or the second response to sin. This is the one, the earthly one. And God punishes Adam and Eve. Now, as I read this, notice who gets punished the worst. Okay? And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, and, and upon thy belly thou shalt go. And thus shall thou eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Okay? 
which is a prophetic statement about the Christ that was going to come. Now it's very interesting to note here that the serpent apparently walked. Didn't crawl on the ground, he walked. I remember taking a course up at CCNY in, in biology and the professor had brought in this skeleton of a huge snake and he was telling the class, look at this, he was trying to show us about evolution. Look at this skeleton. We can see from the way the skeleton is shaped and the bones and so on, that this serpent at one time walked. And I'm sitting there saying, look at this. He's trying to convince us about evolution. What he's really proving is the Bible. And then he even noticed, he said, and even if you look at his, his head, it looks like he could talk or make noise, right? So I went up to him at the end of the class and I said, Professor, how, when did this come out? Oh, recently. I said, I read that in an old book. He said, bring it in. So I brought my Bible in. Then to a class of about 200 people, I read Genesis. And he was shocked because it proved what he said. The snake walked, the snake could talk. And here it was in the Bible written thousands and thousands of years ago, right? Amen. And again, so he punishes the snake. The snake. Every time we see snakes, we see the result in their in their uh, ancestors. What it what, what it cost them. But then he punishes Adam and Eve. Now listen carefully. Unto the woman he said, "I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception." But apparently up to this time, Eve had had not children. So he now is punishing her in the sense that she's going to have a lot of pain and sorrow and so on. And we, if, you're better, if you are a woman and has had children, you know that in most cases there's a lot of pain that goes with it. And then it says, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. So you'll be like a servant to your husband, which unfortunately women today don't read. Right? Remember, Adam was born first. He was the one that had dominion. And he, his wife was his helpmate. She was supposed to help him become what God created him for. Is somebody listening out there? Watch out. Right? Now notice what he does to Adam. Remember, Eve took the fruit. Eve ate the fruit first. But Adam was right there with her. And it says... To Adam he says, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. Some people can use that even today, right? As a punishment. You listen to what she said instead of me. God, I told you not to do that. Not to take any fruit from that tree and eat it, right? Now you blame your wife, right? And has eaten of the tree. Not only did you listen to your wife, but you actually ate the fruit. And then he says, I command thee saying this, thou shalt not eat of it, the ground is cursed for thy sake. In other words, before this, food just grew, things just grew. He didn't have to work hard, right? And now the ground was going to be hard to plant perhaps, hard to produce the fruit. He would have to work. Listen to this, it says, Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field, and in the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread. In other words, Adam didn't have to work hard. Now he would have to work hard to survive. And he says, you will be in that state till you return into the dust of the ground. Now notice this. What he's saying to Adam is this. And I believe God, this original plan that Adam and Eve would live forever. But now death would come upon all men and women because of this sin, this disobedience. And of course, Adam and Eve were thrown out of the garden. The garden was sealed, it was guarded, they couldn't go back. And unfortunately, we see that when you sin, as a parent especially, it can have an adverse effect on your children. 
And we go to, we go to chapter 4, we see that Adam and Eve have two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain the oldest and then Abel, right? And apparently both these sons had grown up and they wanted to make an offering to God. And in doing so, it seems that Abel made the correct offering. He took an animal from his stock and he sacrificed it. On the other hand, Cain was more of a, of a farmer of, of vegetables and goods like that. And he made an offering which was of food that you would eat. You know, apples, oranges, tomatoes, whatever it was. And he notices that God, Cain notices that God did not accept this offering. And, and Cain, it says Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. He expected to be praised. And in, instead, God was angry with him. And the Lord said unto, unto Cain, Why art thou angry? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? In other words, if you listen to what you were supposed to do and did it right, your, your sacrifice would be accepted. But if you do not well, then sin lieth at the door. Wow. This was a warning to Cain because here he was, hearing God, seeing God, knowing what happened to his parents and so on. He now is very angry at his brother because his brother's sacrifice was, was accepted and his wasn't. And unfortunately, he plans to kill his brother. And if we go on to read it, we see that Cain rose up against Abel and he slays him. He kills him. And the Lord comes to Cain. It's amazing how God works. He comes to Cain and he says, where is your brother? Knowing that the brother is dead and even buried. And Cain says, I don't know where he is. Am I my brother's keeper? Famous quote, right? And then God says, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth out from the ground to him, to God. And in verse 11, we see the second punishment for sin. And now thou art cursed from the earth. And he punished Cain for the rest of his life. He wasn't killed. But he had to live a life he was marked and apparently lived that way the rest of his life, away from God. Now, we're going to see that with what we have just read is that sin, as time goes on, becomes even more easy for people because there will be so many people that are sinning. And it's easy to join in because everybody's doing it. And unfortunately, this is what happens. Let's take a look as we close. I don't want to give you the whole thing because we're going to go on this for a while. The scriptures tell us a lot about sin. 1 Kings 8.46 says, For there is no man, we'll add women to that, that sinneth not. In other words, every single one of us at some point is guilty of sin, disobeying God, disobeying his word. And then in Proverbs 20 and 9, it says, Who can say I have made my heart clean? I am pure from my, any, my sins. This tells us that we cannot change. We cannot erase sin. We cannot cleanse sin. We cannot wash it away of ourselves. And as we go into the new covenant, we see the only way we can and now in the new covenant is because of the blood shed on the cross of Calvary by the, our Lord Jesus. In Ecclesiastes 7.20, For there is not a just man, a righteous man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Wow. <laughs> That's a downer, isn't it? It is a description of a person who does good and yet, he's also, or she's also sinning. In Isaiah 53, 6, 
Isaiah describes it this way. All we, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray, away from the shepherd, into the dangerous part of, of uh, the world. In this way, it, it, we're talking about the spiritual things. Because if we go away from the, the shepherd, we are on our own, and you know what happens. We get hurt. In Isaiah, again, 64, 6, it says, But we all, as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness is as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Wow. You wouldn't want to hear that at a funeral. He basically is saying, we can't change. We can't follow a path of righteousness on our own. Coming into the new covenant, Romans 3.23, you can look these scriptures up. For all have sinned, not some, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you look in your Bible from cover to cover, you will find that every righteous man or woman that is mentioned was not perfect. They were sinners. There isn't one perfect man or woman in the scriptures except for Jesus Christ without sin. We'll talk about that. But every one of us, if it's either physically sinning or even in our mind, we are guilty. And thank God for grace and mercy. Otherwise, we'd all end up with, the, with our friend Lucifer in the, the, the uh, fiery, fiery place that God has prepared for him. Again, in 1 John, it says, if we say we have no sin, this is, this is amazing. There are people who really believe they don't sin. They've never sinned. And the fact that you do that is a sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 1 John 1 and 8. This is a very powerful scripture. It means not one of us can come to God and say, I'm perfect, God. Can I come into your kingdom? Because we're not. In one way or the other, we disobey God. But thank you for, for Christ, our intercessor, who can help us work it out, get stronger, and, and also forgive us and cleanse our sins. Amen? Let me end with this. Through the, through the Bible, we see eight separate occasions when an individual is forced to utter these words. You ready? I have sinned. Nobody wants to say that because it is a, is a truth about ourselves. It means that we can, we're not perfect, right? The Pharaoh in Exodus 9 and 27. Balaam, the prophet in Numbers 22, 34. Achan in Joshua 7 and 20. King Saul in 1 Samuel 26 and 21. King David in 2 Samuel 12 and 13. And then in 24 and 10. Job, the story of Job in Job 7 and 29. The prodigal son that Jesus spoke of as, as a, a, a story, a learning story. Luke 15, 21, had to admit that he had sinned. And of course, probably the most famous is Judas, Matthew 27 and 4. When he betrayed the Lord, he admitted that he had sinned, but it was too late for him. Now, the things that we have to see at, in our own life is the fact that we are sinners. As hard as we try, we sin. A glance, a word, an attitude causes us to say and do things that become sin. Sin against God and many times sin against God and also people as well. So as we study sin, we're going to see there really is no excuse for it, but there is a cure. And that cure is Jesus Christ. But he is not there just like a machine, I sin today, forgive me. I sin tomorrow, forgive me. 
He wants us to what? To recognize perhaps a fault that we have in our life that causes us to sin and to invite him in, in this Holy Spirit, of course, to help us not to continue to sin. But none of us can say we do not sin. So don't feel bad if you say, well, I'm, I've done this, I'm doing this, I'm in this. Yes, you're in sin. But the good news is that God wants to forgive you. But he doesn't want you to keep sinning. And this is the way that we come to the Lord. We come to the Lord as sinners. We come, we admit, just like we said before, I have sinned. That's the way we come to Christ. I have sinned. I am a sinner. I've had people say they never sin. And like we read, the Bible says, if you say you never sin, you've deceived yourself. And it's a sin to say you didn't sin. Again, we have to be honest with God because we can't fool him and he knows everything. He knows our thoughts. He knows everything about us. And thank you. We thank God for his, his mercy and his grace because without that, none of us, none of us would get to heaven. We'll close this, morning, this today and we'll continue in sin, the, stu the study of sin and how to avoid it. God bless you and have a blessed day.